Well, hello everybody and many thanks. Uh, a huge number of registrations for this particular webinar, the latest in Hydroterra's webinar series, this one on deep groundwater sampling, which is something that Hydroterra has had a lot of experience with. Uh, next slide, thanks, Kyle. So today we have Kyle McLaren, who's Hydroterra's product sales manager, presenting on various technology options and how they're applied for the particular purpose of deep groundwater sampling. And you have myself talking about various methods for deep groundwater sampling. So Kyle will be focused more on the technology and I'll be focused more on the methods and some learnings from some pretty big projects we've worked on, which have required sampling from really deep depths. Um, and in the background, we have Michelle Canton, who is looking after the webinar. So um, many thanks to the team. Okay, now this is a very important part of our webinars. We love getting lots of questions and we have a really good history of getting lots of questions. Just make sure that you do type them in to that Q&A section. Um, it's, it's great to get that and uh, put, type those questions in and at the end, I will read out those questions and Kyle and myself will then uh, do our best to provide you with comprehensive answers to those. All right, so why does Hydroterra undertake these webinars? We like to generate awareness and share knowledge of the technologies and the methodologies that Hydroterra is developing or responsible for. And uh, we really like to get that out to the broader community. So that's uh, one of the key objectives. We also believe in facilitating training. I think training is an ongoing and really important part of what uh, Hydroterra is about. And that uh, is obviously part of this webinar. Um, lastly, and most importantly, we like to get a better understanding of industry needs. Uh, Everyone has their own specific needs for environmental monitoring, and this is one mechanism for us to get a greater understanding from yourselves of these specific challenges that you're facing. Uh, next slide, thanks, Carl. All right, so in terms of the topic of deep groundwater sampling, I will be talking a bit about the methods and guidelines and some of the challenges around deep groundwater sampling. And Kyle's gonna take over and run through various equipment technology options and considerations in putting together your sampling plans and equipment requirements for any particular job. We will then talk about a specific case study which involved very deep groundwater sampling. Next slide, thanks, Carl. All right, so into the guts of this. Um, in um, Hydroterra's history, really our knowledge on deep groundwater sampling stemmed from two really large projects, which allowed us to spend a lot of time to research, not only how to collect samples, but the various technologies that were out there. One of those projects was up in the Surat Basin, which was associated with coal seam gas monitoring. Coal seam gas operations uh, occur at depths of in excess of 800 metres. And part of the operation of those coal seam gas fields involved monitoring the uh, various aquifers adjacent to the gas bearing layers, as well as monitoring the water levels within the gas bearing layers. So coal seam gas involves depressurizing the coal seam gas uh, formations, and that means gas is then generated and that they collect that gas. The concern obviously is uh, 
if you're extracting that water and depressurizing at a particular depth that you will impact on the aquifers either side of, of that formation, which might affect other beneficial uses of those other formations. So I just put this schematic in on the right to show you uh, a little bit about the challenges of this job. So there were several different geological formations. There was the Gaburamunda formation, the Westbourne formation, Springbok formation, the Walloon coal measures, which were really the main formation with the gas in it. Then underneath that, the Urimbar formation and the Hutton formation. Now those formations had varying degrees of water in them and, and different hydraulic conditions. But the challenge of this job was how to collect a groundwater sample to look at the impacts on water quality that were occurring potentially associated with the coal seam gas operation. Um, some of the things to think about there are, well, which formation are you actually trying to collect those samples from? Um, this particular schematic shows um, slotted casing, but in many of the holes, they were just open, open hole below. So you'd have a steel casing at the top coming down a fairway, but then you just have an open hole section. So some of those sections uh, of open hole were, you know, uh, very long in themselves, 50 or 100 metres long of open hole. So even within the open hole section, which part of that did you want to sample? So there was various complexity around that. But I guess the main purpose of this schematic is to make you think about, well, when you're going deep, typically you are uh, dealing with multiple layers of formation and uh, you're also dealing with various issues such as off-gassing. So when you're doing this sort of thing, what we were engaged to, to review the various sampling options that were available to collect samples from those sort of depths. The deepest depths were in excess of uh, 1,000 metres below ground surface. And uh, there are many things you need to consider in that. So the first thing we did was a big technology sort of review and developed a bit of a selection process around that. Out of all of that, really it boiled down to two groupings of technologies that we thought would be most applicable in that particular scenario. It's not to say they're applicable in all, but in that scenario. And they were dedicated pneumatic bladder pumps or double valve pumps. In the case of the bladder pumps, these are equipped with a drop tube assembly with or without a multi-port inlet assembly. Now, a drop tube assembly sits below your bladder pump and it, it's lowered down into the well and it has an inlet significantly deeper than where the pump itself is deployed. When you operate the pump, the water flows up the drop tube assembly. Kyle will talk more about the operation of those. One of the key considerations though is um, whether or not you're actually trying to collect um, constituents of the water which are dissolved gases. And if you are, uh, then you need to take into account that those dissolved gases do start to effervesce as you bring them to the surface. So um, you need to deal with the fact that whilst they may be dissolved at depth, by the time they're depressurizing coming up your sampling, they start to effervesce. And if you don't collect that gas, you've got a changed composition of your water. Therefore, you're no longer collecting something representative of what it's like at that depth. So quite a few challenges there. The second sorts of devices are grab sampling devices. These can be mechanical or pneumatic and Kyle's gonna run through a couple of examples of those, including some new ones. Um, some of which weren't even around at the time of this particular project we worked on. Um, the real challenge with collecting grab samples at depth is those samples are collected from a zone of very high pressure, you know, they've got say 800 metres of head of water on them. That's a lot of pressure. When you bring those samplers up to the surface, uh, that sample is pressurised in that because these devices tend to be uh, sealed. So when you get to the surface, you have a pressurised device, which has safety considerations and all sorts of things about it. 
So uh, how you decant a sample out of a pressurized sampling device is not immaterial. Next slide, thanks Kyle. So on this project, I just thought it was worth putting in here. This is a matrix which helped us to ultimately select and rank what was the best way to collect samples. Down the left-hand column there, you'll see a bunch of different technology types like grab samplers, mechanical depth specific samplers, etc. It just really shows you that there are a wealth of different ways to collect groundwater samples. And then across the top with the site specific considerations, right? So what do we need to think about on our site when looking to choose the particular methodology to use? So just going across that top row, well construction is something that is very, very important. Often the diameter of your well is critical. Some of these sampling devices are quite wide in diameter. So you need to make sure, for example, it will actually fit down your well. You know, you might be sniggering, but that is often the case that people have got to site and found that they can't actually fit the device down the hole. Second thing is what they call headworks. So in the coal seam gas fields, the headworks on a number of wells were actually pretty complex. Some wells were artesian. So the headworks structures of your wells or the piece that's sitting at the, the ground surface, you need to be able to have an idea of that before you go out and sample. Sometimes the headworks is actually the headworks associated with an existing pump that might be down that well. That's particularly the case on farmers' wells. So you need to know that before you start. Um, do you need to be monitoring level at the same time you're sampling? If the answer to that's yes, then you need to think carefully about how you're deploying your pumps to allow that to happen. Uh, if you're dedicating low flow pumps down a well, uh, for example, then lowering a dip meter down next to that um, is, is something that's important, but it also instigates the potential for that device to get tangled in there. Some people dedicate pressure transducers next to uh, the pumps they deploy, for example. It's really important to think about your monitoring frequency requirements. So that's typically stipulated in your monitoring plan. But if you need to monitor, you know, more than three or four times a year, uh, or even less when you're talking about really deep sampling, you're better off to ded dedicate these deep sampling devices because it takes a lot of time to deploy them. And uh, there's a lot of risk when you're deploying for very deep sampling that you're going to tangle things up and potentially block a well. So you want to think about the risk reward there, the cost of uh, dedicating a ladder pump or a double valve pump becomes immaterial in the context of having a blocked well. So uh, in this particular study, we ended up uh, recommending dedicated pumps in, in wells. And um, that it's, it's, it's worth doing a sort of time and motion study to work out how long it's going to take to deploy the sampling because sometimes just deploying the pump takes, you know, a couple of hours um, and your cost versus the cost of the pump. I mean, the payoff period is very quick. Aquifer considerations, well, I mentioned that earlier, but one thing to really think hard about is if you're dealing with an open screened interval and you're lowering a low flow pump, there's plenty of works being done on stratification of water quality within open screen intervals. You need to think about your formation and the homogeneity of that and whether a low flow approach is appropriate, for example, or grab sampling for that matter. Uh, sometimes you want to prevent connectivity between various zones and you can get various disks and things to put up above and below your sampling devices to effectively isolate zones to some degree. Uh, depth and pressure considerations, well, absolutely critical. And uh, 
you know, standing water level in particular becomes very important in terms of choosing pneumatic devices, for example. Do you need to do conventional purging? So sometimes the requirements uh, in your monitoring plan are driven by a legislative requirement. Um, if conventional purging is required, then obviously you're not going to be selecting a low flow pump for that because it won't have the capacity to purge it. With these really deep wells, conventional purging is pretty impractical. The volumes of water you need to purge a, a one kilometre deep well, for example, just make it a pretty silly thing to consider. Uh, is low flow sampling appropriate? Uh, that's sort of a bit of a double up with what I spoke about in terms of aquifer considerations. Uh, no purge or passive sampling, is that appropriate? Um, sometimes it is, so you need to decide on that. Passive samplers are those sorts of samplers that you leave in place, come back, retrieve, and uh, uh, they, they basically stay in, in the hole most of the time. They can be useful. They're no good for, in general, for if you're dealing with dissolved gases. Um, minimal water column disturbance. You can imagine uh, if you're lowering a pump down 800 metres, there's a fair bit of mixing going on in your water column as you lower that pump down. That's one of the big considerations for whether or not to choose dedicating a pump in a well or uh, going between wells using the same sampling setup. As a general rule, I would recommend dedicating pumps when you have you know, repeat sampling to be done. It just removes a whole lot of errors associated with samples. Sample preparation, storage and handling. This really was very significant in this area because the Surat Basin is a very isolated area and just the holding times to get samples to the laboratory were extremely challenging. And the sampling times that we had using the low flow technologies meant that you may only be doing a couple of samples a day, and then you had to somehow get these samples to a lab that was often many hours away. Um, so you really do need to think about what you're gonna to do to prepare, store and handle those samples for those logistical considerations. Water quality parameters. So we, I presume most people on this uh, webinar understand the importance of collecting field parameters, but a lot of sampling methods where you're using grab samples don't really allow you to get the intel that you get through a low flow sampling or a continuous sampling approach where you have the, the opportunity to let those parameters stabilise. So that can be a really important factor. The next one, dissolved gas sampling. If you need to collect dissolved gas samples, that rules out a lot of sampling options. And uh, it's really important to, do, to check your analyte list in that sort of instance. Uh, entrained or evolving gas sampling, that's really uh, the end of dissolved gas sampling is when those gases partition, do you need to collect those gases that are partitioning? What do I mean by partitioning? They're bubbles actually coming up your sampling line. So you're not getting a solid stream of water coming out of your pump anymore. You're getting a bit of a mixture of gas and water coming out. That can be very challenging. Um, Lastly, the operation and maintenance. So here is, it's really about, well, how long will it take you to collect that sample and what sort of maintenance is required around the system that you're setting up? So what I wanted to point out here is there's a lot of things to consider and uh, it's not something to take lightly when you're doing those really deep sampling options. Next slide, thanks, Kyle. There's some guidance out there. Okay, you're probably going, gee, there's a lot to consider. Well, uh, other people have done some of the considering for us. Some of these are, are the same guidelines that we would have showed you with um, just standard low flow sampling. The Geoscience Australia one does take into account um, 
sampling and how to collect uh, gases that are coming out of waters. So it is particularly useful for those deeper groundwater sampling options. It's not to say the others aren't relevant, but Geoscience Australia publication does have additional information in it. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Kyle. All right, so my last uh, comment um, before handing over to Kyle is that deep groundwater sampling is not straightforward. So the two case studies that uh, we talk a bit about today, both had the need for a site-specific specification to be prepared to ensure adequate and appropriate materials were procured before undertaking sampling. Um, that's really important with these bigger projects because uh, the costs of what your actually equipment, et cetera, uh, it's really important to get your head around that at the time of quoting. Uh, the next one is around installation and sampling methodology. Um, significant time is required to install these things and significant time to sample. Um, it's very easy to not include enough time for the sampling. One of two things happens in that sort of scenario. You either are collecting samples uh, inappropriately because you're uh, trying to collect them too quickly or you, you end up under quoting a job because you haven't allowed sufficient time. So it's really important to understand how much time it's going to take to actually do these things. Now, installation, normally you can get a pretty good, safe number, but the actual sampling side of things, uh, if you're sampling from, you know, 800 metres depth, it takes, you know, four hours sometimes to collect a single sample. So you need to be very careful in how you estimate those times. Now, HydroTerra uh, does a lot of this sort of work, and we're happy to work with uh, consultants and, and obviously industry to with some guidance on that or to assist on various projects. Now, over to Kyle, who's going to talk in more depth about the technologies and how we've applied them. Thanks, Richard. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, uh, depending on where you are, and uh, thanks for joining us. So um, the ways in which we would be able to obtain a sample from depth uh, is quite wide and the technologies and offerings out there uh, in the market can be almost daunting uh, with how much uh, is out there. We see uh, a few examples here of some of the technologies, you know, from simple balers, point source balers, uh, grab samplers, passive samplers in the diffusion bags, uh, hydro sleeves, you know, gas driven pumps, uh, a lot of the things that uh, Richard was talking about in that uh, previous uh, schematic. Um, and if we, we go through each method uh, and technology, we'd be, we'd be here for a very long time. Uh, but given the, uh, the vast and various ways to sample, uh, a lot of the times the preferred method to obtain the best representative samples of the aquifer is attempting to uh, conduct low flow or in some instances grab sampling uh, from the screen uh, of deep bores. And oftentimes uh, the technologies that allow us to perform this uh, in your standard 50 mil uh, bores gives us a bit of a size restriction as well. So it's often the main scenario that we see most of the time. And this leads us to a couple of pieces uh, of kit and considerations, which will be uh, our main focus today. So what are the methods that we uh, typically select or what do I see? So Richie did speak uh, just briefly on the, uh, for the bladder pump with the drop tube uh, assembly. Uh, our main um, bladder pump that we deal with, uh, obviously, is the 407 bladder pump. Um, you know, so we're utilising basically a 1.6 inch pump uh, with a drop tube set up. Um, the important part with this is that generally with the bladder pumps, we have a, a maximum operation limit. Um, and in the case of the 407, this is 150 metres below ground level. So the reason for the for the uh, drop tube is that you know our pump can be placed higher, uh, and the drop tube uh, you know wherever you'd like basically for less pressure requirements. Um, 
our bladders that are available in the in the bladder pumps, you know, LDPA, PTFE um, for longer term deployments. However, you know, when we're dealing with those higher pressures that we might see if we elect to sit the pump uh, in between that sort of 100 metre to 150 metre mark, which we tend to see on standing water levels uh, with very deep, very deep bores, um, generally recommend sort of the, the Teflon um, bladder if you can, uh, given the high pressure ratings. Um, typically, sometimes, you know, this can be a method that people uh, elect to use just from the uh, preventing of, of contact of air supply with the sample water um, and the operation with the bladder pumps. Some people prefer as it's a bit less fine tuning. Um, however, we'll talk a bit more um, in depth in a minute in the installation sort of considerations when looking to go with the, with the drop tube assembly. Uh, the maximum flow rates approximately, you know, 1.5, around about two litres a minute in uh, in these bladder pumps. And, uh, you know, ability to dedicate as well for, for the 407 also. So uh, I've seen that a lot, you know, with our clients that uh, they do often with the deeper stuff want to uh, dedicate these, these drop tubes uh, with the bladder pumps. Um, but also, as you know, we also said, uh, and Richard mentioned that uh, our choice for uh, the preferred deep groundwater pump is the uh, the Solons double valve for 408. Um, important that we sort of address a couple of things here on the on this one in that uh, compression fittings used for deep applications now. Um, Recently, uh, Silence have uh, elected a standard to have the connections on the pump as barb fittings. Uh, that's okay with uh, sort of your normal depth sampling uh, requirements, but um, we've been fortunate enough to have the ability to still uh, order these pumps with the compression fittings as they were uh, a while back, um, which is what we recommend if you're looking to, to deal with deeper applications um, on this. So just a, a little bit around the, uh, the theory, I suppose, on these double valve pumps that allow us to be able to sample from such a depth. With the 407s or any bladder pump, you're actually calculating PSI pressures based on the pump intake, uh, given that there's a bladder there. So that, off, that has its limitations um, there in electing uh, without a, a drop tube. But in the case of the double valve, uh, if we have the ability to have our standing water level in our bores less than 150 metres. Theoretically, we can place this pump uh, wherever we like the pump intake. And that comes more into play, I guess, around in the installation requirements when we're going a bit deeper, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the quick theory on these pumps is that uh, you know, the, the valves inside the pump allow that water to come back up the drive line uh, to standing water level. And then we're simply applying drive gas on that column of uh, water in that drive tube uh, down to create that loop which pushes the sample line up uh, to get our sample. So uh, we're using a little less uh, pressures when we're just calculating at standing water level um, that way. So we do see some uh, higher flow rates that we can achieve with the double valve pump, which is another reason why we sort of elect this way. Uh, we tend to see that um, you sort of get a little bit less of a sample uh, and takes a little bit longer in the 407 with the drop tube assembly uh, aspect. And uh, as I said, yeah, yeah, less PSI pressure required as calculations work on standing water level. So there's a lot of considerations really that we've learnt over the time and a lot of uh, clients that I've spoken with um, and what we have experienced out in the field ourselves for uh, the deep groundwater sampling. Um, so key factors, and probably just to reiterate a few points that Richard might have mentioned earlier, um, but uh, these points, I guess I'll, I'll go into a, a bit more uh, detail uh, in a minute, but um, you know, probably the first one, yeah, initial sounding of the well, it sounds pretty basic, um, but it's, it's very important, obviously, for obvious reasons. We want to make, you know, we want to make sure that there's not a breakage 100, two meters, 200 meters down um, before we even start placing the pump. So very important, uh, the weights if you set up, buoyancy issues with your weight, the tubing considerations, you know, is there a drop tube needed? Uh, another point that Richard made was, you know, allowance of time for proper installation per well. 
obviously the last thing we want to do is have a pump stuck at 600 meters and uh, it's probably the thing that snags a lot of uh, clients um, in is the allowance of time for the proper installation uh, of these and taking your time with it uh, very slowly to be able to install these pumps at the depth uh, you'd rather take your time than have it stuck um, so that's an important one. Um, it's just your designs of your well caps, uh, which I did mention about the off-gassing, which we'll talk a little bit in a second. And of course, um, coming back to that allowance of time, dedicated versus portable setups. So um, when we're talking about sampling depth considerations, just around the specs, I suppose, of those pumps and what I was talking about earlier. So Again, we're calculating pressure requirements depending on the standing water level. If, uh, standing water level, if we elect to go with the the double valve, um, so that allows a lot of flexibility there uh, to be able to um, put it wherever we like, really. And uh, we'll talk about a case study uh, shortly about how deep we've actually gone with these specific pumps. Um, and then, you know, for this reason tangle of the pumps during deployment with tubing, cable, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff going down there, especially if you have additional things down your hole. Um, so for this reason, what I was talking about with allowance of time is that it should be undertaken very slowly um, to install your pumps. You know, we can use manual reels. If you think about uh, our installation at depths of 800, 900, sometimes even a kilometre down, um, we're utilising some pretty heavy gear uh, at the top with manual cranks, uh, that sort of thing, to let our, our wire down slowly and, and just allow to give us the best possible chance to not get any blockages. So one thing I talk about a lot uh, with um, clients looking to do deep groundwater sampling is the buoyancy considerations. So around about the 300 metres submergence depth, you know, we start to see the buoyancy of the tubing come into effect. So actual... Uh, the the tubing will have enough buoyancy in it to start to cause the pump to come back up on itself um, around the 300 metre mark. So that obviously opens up a lot of things in terms of potentially getting stuck. Um, so it's important to have enough weight on the bottom of the pump to all drop tube assembly to allow for as straight a tube as we possibly can when installing. Uh, a couple of examples there is the double valve pump on the left. Um, we had a, a custom uh, milled, that's just a milled stainless steel a spike, uh, which is a solid piece, which just is for the sheer purpose of weight um, down there uh, to just to give us enough weight to put that pump down where we needed it to be. Uh, for the buoyancy issues, if people wanted to elect to go with the with the bladder with the drop tube, I have seen in other instances uh, with that picture on the right, just as a little example, um, some short pieces of you know thick stainless steel pipe or even like discs uh, on on the end of the drop tube threaded through that half inch tubing, uh, just to allow that extra weight. And the reason why we have short pieces along the length of it is just to allow us to have that still have that flexibility in the tubing to potentially snake down the hole if we have really long pieces um and that's that's something that occurred with the picture on the left is that that was probably a little bit too long that spike um and was causing you know, a little bit of difficulty um in that um, but just to allow us to have that flexibility in the in the drop tube to still snake down the hole and not cause any rigid uh, areas with long pieces of pipe. So considerable amount of weight, uh, just consider your weight requirements when, you, when you're dealing, depending on how deep you're going. Um, but obviously we can talk through that uh, in more detail if you need um, more guidance on that. Um, the, the tubing considerations. So your you know, pressure and burst pressure of your tubing. So this is an important one that I talk about a lot with people in that around, again, around that 300 metre mark. Um, you know, LDPE is considered suitable by many operators and it's, you know, for general uh, sampling, that is, it is fine, it is okay. Um, but there's probably consideration to switch to HDPE uh, if we're dealing with really deep stuff. So, it can be a little bit harder to work with, but 
when we when we've got really long uh, pieces of tubing, like we're talking you know, hundreds of meters, uh, there's a stretching that can occur along the length, and it actually compresses the diameter inside the tubing, which puts a bit of strain on our and our upstream uh, controllers and pressure and that sort of thing to allow us to get enough through that tubing. So that stretching actually reduces the diameter internally of that tubing and can cause a bit of strain. And so by having that extra rigidity in the HDPE, um, that has allowed us to overcome a few things. And that's what we utilised uh, in the case study we'll talk about later. Uh, in some cases, you know, Teflon coated LDPE tubing uh, can be used as it's just less prone to contamination from organic compounds, that sort of thing. But uh, there's also the cost consideration on that because um, as we probably all know, tubing, Teflon tubing is uh, quite expensive, but just a, a point to make there. And uh, food grade or similarly tested material should be used when possible uh, to minimise false positives. So coming back again, I guess, I guess in that weight consideration, when we're talking about pump suspension, so there is a risk of pump detachment at the tubing connectors, uh, which is why we recommend having those compression fittings uh, on that tubing. Uh, I have seen in the past that people uh, install these dedicated pumps just on the tubing and compression fittings themselves. Um, I always recommend to have a suspension anchor, particularly with the deeper stuff. Uh, as you can imagine, we might have additional weight at the bottom of that pump as well to overcome some buoyancy issues. Uh, so just allowing, uh, having an allowance on those compression fittings themselves on the tubing is just simply not enough. Um, we need to utilize that suspension anchor that's on the pump um, to avoid uh, that coming off. Um, and probably one to mention is that if you can imagine we're dealing with hundreds of meters of, of cabling, if we elect to go the stainless steel cable, uh, just your weight considerations on that can be incredibly heavy. Uh, and so for the really deep stuff that we did, uh, we elected to go with the, with the Kevlar line uh, on there just to reduce some of the weight uh, in, the, in the setup. So important to consider that. So just a bit more detail on the drop tubes. Um, deploying the drop tubes can be problematic. Um, they are you know, prone to tangling uh, in the bores and that's probably the biggest uh, one to underline there in that uh, the installation uh, requirements of having the drop tube and probably the one thing that comes uh, undone um, with our selection versus a double valve and and uh, and a drop tube assembly is that you, we have a weight at the bottom we have a large piece a long piece of half inch tubing and then we have another weight in the pump body itself and then more tubing in that twin bonded so it just opens up more room for that drop tube assembly if there's not enough weight there to come back up on that half inch tubing and start to tangle as we keep lowering that pump body down to where we need it to be. And that can just cause, um, can cause tangles and that tended to occur uh, a lot with um, some people trying to install those. Um, so it's really important that if we elect that, again, it comes back to that time allowance when you're doing your installations with those pumps. Uh, to really take your time with it if you want to elect to go with a drop tube. Um, but again, that's why we recommend having the double valves because you know your entirety of your weight is at the very bottom and you're only dealing with uh, twin bonded tubing all the way down instead of uh, you know thicker half inch tubing, um, which has more potential to be wrapped up uh, in it. So just consider that um, your buoyancy restrictions as well. And also you just a little bit of decrease in flow rate um, between the two. So Richard did mention about the off-gassing considerations uh, on this, you know, as we move from high pressures in very deep wells up to, to lower pressures, we bring the sample up and we can potentially see some off-gassing occur uh, in waters containing dissolved gas. And uh, ourselves and Geoscience Australia um, have developed some, you know, methods to enable us to sort of sample those off gases 
which uh, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, uh, just on a case study there. Um, but uh, Richard did mention a bit of that before, so we'll move on. Uh, now, you, your well cap considerations as well, probably just another point that I wanted to mention uh, in this is uh, generally we utilize the dedicated um, silenced like well cap just with the 50 mil casings uh, with the safety hook and push fittings uh, on the bottom there in that in that lower right hand picture. Um, there are several well cap options on the market and there is compatibility with the pumps that you elect versus the well caps that you might utilize uh, along with the controllers that you might utilize um, to get your desired pressures when doing your sampling. Um, it's probably just important to mention that you know most of the pumps have cross compatibility with whatever well cap you elect. Generally, there's just going to be um, some tubing push fittings at the bottom there to to connect into it, and then your head works at the top of that cap uh, would probably be you know compatible with whatever controller you want to elect. So um, for well casings that are you know greater than 50 mil, uh, a couple of you know a couple of options you can either go a customized sort of well cap that you that you drill yourself, which uh, is in that picture there um, up on the left, or, you know, we go to reducer um, couplings over the top of the casing uh, to put it back to that 50 mil capacity to then allow us to use the dedicated caps. So just a couple of considerations in regards to the well cap. And just your uh, air supply options. Um, just a couple of points, I suppose. Um, when dealing with the higher pressures required for the sampling, we just recommend having really high rated PSI controllers and compressed gas. That sounds simple, uh, but it just allows us flexibility on site to be able to increase uh, pressures if needed. Um, sometimes people will try and spec to meet uh, getting lower uh, rated controllers or something like that. And it's just uh, important to just have that allowance. Um, when you're dealing with the upper echelons of some potentially lower PSI rated controllers, uh, you just run the risk of uh, some maintenance requirements there through that. So important to spec highly on the PSI ratings. And recommended, you know, with the compressors, I've been asked that quite a bit uh, around using compressors. Um, for general low flow sampling, they're okay. Um, however, with really high pressures, we I always recommend bottled gas um, due to that sort of operation of the compressor trying to maintain a pressure in its chamber while you're utilizing it. Um, if you needed to go compressors, you have to then look at exploring options, you know, with that sort of dive rated compressor that allows you to have quite high pressures and they can be quite expensive. Um, if we go the lower rated compressors, there's just a risk of burning them out because if we're dealing with higher pressures, they're just constantly trying to maintain a pressure uh, within the chamber. So there's just that risk there. And um, generally with uh, the compressed gas side of things, CO2 and nitrogen are the ones we typically use. Uh, with the really deep stuff, we tend to get higher pressure ratings with nitrogen, um, but I can you know, explore that with you and talk that through if you, if you need. Uh, just before the case study, uh, is an interesting one that uh, Silenced have just released, which is the uh, 425 uh, Deep Discrete Sampler. Uh, this is the piece of kit that Richard said uh, has been released uh, prior to us doing all that uh, sampling, which would have been handy to have, but I just thought there was an interesting piece of kit to add here. So now I have capability to take a discrete sample up to 1,200 metres down, um, utilising this uh, slightly adjusted uh, discrete sampler that operating on sort of an internal piston system, um, overcoming, you know, hydrostatic pressure uh, you know, um, at those depths that you're, that you're looking to sample at. So again, that also has the options to then start adding weights uh, to the bottom to overcome that buoyancy issue uh, on there. So this is a new piece of kit uh, and we're looking to explore as well. Um, and we'll, get one and test it and we'll be happy to, to talk through some potential on how that could potentially work with your applications also. So just at the end here was the case study. Uh, so we undertook some 
groundwater and dissolved gas sampling on behalf of DPIE in the Gippsland and Otway basins um, for Victorian water science studies. And we sampled some bores there that were in excess of 1200 metres in depth. Um, so obviously, as Richard and myself have been talking about, that sort of proved some very high challenges there in terms of how we sample uh, to that depth. And we developed and reviewed uh, some SOPs and source custom equipment in order to conduct the sampling at those depths required. Um, the sampling of the dissolved gas um, as it was depressurized was uh, sort of, you know, monitored through a water gas separator. As you can see in the right image there, uh, a GA and uh, the gas was actually collected through sumer canisters uh, used to sample from the custom wellhead. So that schematic on the on the top there was a bit of a breakdown with the, the various different ways and you can sort of see uh, the complexity and how to actually uh, sample uh, from those depths when we bring it up and the, the challenges with having that uh, depressurized gas coming up through the separator and how we go about actually obtaining those samples. Um, so that was a very interesting case study uh, on there. Um, but before we go to any questions, uh, Richard, I was just wondering if you had anything else to add in terms of this case study uh, also. Um, uh, Kyle, I think you've covered uh, it all pretty well. I might just emphasise uh, a couple of things here. So the, the challenge with um, the selection of tubing is and the expansion that you mentioned is when the when you're under deploying at, at great depths, choosing to use HDPE is is better because it's a harder material and it actually expands less, which means you when you're pressurizing from the surface, you don't lose as much pressure when you're on your drive cycle. So it actually holds holds firm. If you can imagine across a length of a kilometre, a, a little expansion in tubing across a whole kilometre adds up to a lot, which can be a lot of volume of air to deliver to try and push that sample up. So uh, it's very important that you do consider HDPE for those deeper samples. So just clarifying a little bit there. The second one is with the the things that I guess uh, the learning from these sorts of projects are drop tube assemblies, whilst they sound attractive, um, are actually the source of quite a few blocked holes out there because that tubing does end up wrapping around your pump, um, like Kyle mentioned before. So we're, when we're doing this, we typically have the double valve pump at the end of the tubing. Uh, and with weights on that double valve pump, just to avoid the, the potential for that jamming of the wells, because it does happen, right? It's a reality. Uh, and then maybe the last learning that came out of this project was sometimes you can have descriptions of wells which aren't actually accurate in terms of their diameters. Mm -hmm. So things like uh, uh, often you'll have... Uh, say a stainless steel screen down the well, which may be a different diameter to the uh, PVC casing, for example. And that can lead to problems where if you've got relatively low tolerances between the diameter of your pump and of, uh, and of the screen, you can end up with that pump getting stuck in the screened interval. So definitely worth learning about that but this project was a fantastic project it, it involved you know sampling I think it was something like 70 wells and uh, it was a good example of us collaborating with Jacobs to deliver that data for ultimately a sort of statewide assessment of uh, the groundwater and the dissolved gases within it so we're at that uh, time Kyle I think we might head over to the Q&A um yeah yep we'll, we'll start to see what we have coming through we have a few questions uh i'll just go through the chat area first just to see if there's anything 
Uh, Andrew Davidson, yeah, removing the pumps and tubing can be problematic. The tubing can be electrostatically attracted to the sides of the bore. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, that's an interesting point there. Thanks, David. And temperature depth is also an important consideration for tubing. Yes, that's a good point. Um, and thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth Stanmore said, thank you. Uh, keep going with the webinar series. It's great. Thank you for the feedback there, Elizabeth. Uh, so in terms of some questions, we've got a couple. Uh, anonymous, uh, what depth is it generally accepted that a program is considered deep water sampling versus a depth which uses conventional standard monitoring methods? I could probably answer that one. Yeah, yep. I, yep. Uh, I can chime in if need. Norm normally, where you start, uh, where you've got a standing water level that is getting towards the limit of. Uh, deploying a pump without a drop tube assembly, I suppose. So your operating depth, your maximum operating depth of say a Solon's bladder pump is about 150 metres. Um, so when you're so when you're deploying or needing to deploy at that sort of depth below ground surface, I suppose I would consider that as being deep uh, would be the way I would, would view that. Yeah, more. yeah, I think that's 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 true. I guess it's just the when we start to look at the specs of an operation uh, of the equipment uh, being utilised, and when we have to go, you know, think about going above those specs uh, on standard standard uh, operation principles. I think is probably when we start to look at considering it a deep water sampling. Um, and you know, utilization of drop tubes and everything to take that screen past you probably you might be utilizing it you know you might be utilizing drop tubes before you even get to 150 meters if you're looking to just not having to use that much psi pressure but um you know there's considerations based on the specs of the equipment and um if there's potential if you're you know looking uh, at a particular program where you're sort of thinking it might be on the cusp between, you know, standard equipment and whether you need to make a few adjustments based on this this webinar. We're happy to chat through uh, with you. So, uh, Calv, Calvin Baldock uh, come through saying, uh, question one, to ensure isolation of, pump, of sampling pump to the target zone, are uh, packers above and below the pump position ever deployed? Uh, yes. Um, so Solons have um, got what we call straddle packers, which uh, allow you to inflate uh, packers either side of your inlet of your, your pump to, to isolate a zone. The challenge is to make sure that the packers are spec'd for the particular pressure rating that you're looking at them to perform at. So that's the main thing to, to keep. But the short answer is yes, Cal. Um, there's, there's also other devices that are sometimes used, which are a bit of a sort of compromise, but still considered significant. So some times I've seen plastic discs used which are either side of the sort of pump uh, at either end, and that sounds like, what do you mean a plastic disc? Well, it actually does significantly restrict the vertical movement of the water column, and therefore you're at least getting a much higher level of uh, confidence that the water you're sampling is coming in laterally from your screen and from your formation. So obviously that's a key assumption of low flow sampling that you are getting water coming in from the aquifer, not just coming from either side of your inlet within your well. Uh, so short answer, yes, on that one. Yeah, um, and the question too for Calvin is, uh, has sampling uh, for stygofauna uh, or toglofauna uh, ever been part of the specifications for sampling and analysis in the projects, in our projects? Uh, yes. So we have uh, up actually on that case study that I spoke to at the Surat Basin, Stiger Fauna was, uh, was a target. And uh, I would need to go back to my notes. So Kel, it's a while ago uh, 
to look at what the sampling devices were used for that. Uh, from recollection, we did all of that sampling separate to the actual, uh, you know, devices that we're talking about here today. So you can't use your, obviously your double valve pumps and that sort of thing to collect Stigerforn. You needed separate sampling devices, which I think were like little nets from memory, but I need to check my notes. So maybe I'll take that one on notice and come back to you, but certainly was a key factor. Yeah, excellent. Um, Prachi, uh, is there any contamination from the tubing that you need to worry about? Do you want me to answer that one, Kyle? Or do you yeah, want to yeah, sure. No, that's fine. <laughs> so there's quite a few studies of different sorts of tubing out there. There's, there's studies on contaminants that come out of the plasticizers that are used into the water. And there's studies on the absorption of contaminants that are in your water into those plastics. So there's two potential problems. One is that you're getting contamination that's being absorbed to your sample line and then potentially impacting other samples you might be collecting. So if you're moving between wells, that becomes a real problem if you're reusing the sampling materials, uh, the, like the tubing. But the second factor is you can have effectively uh, some contaminants absorbed to that and then effectively uh, moving back into the, the water column later on and therefore you might have some difference between the composition of what you're sampling versus what the actual aquifer can, condition is at some point in time. So there's, there's absorption of the, the contaminants and look, most... Most of the issues that used to be associated with early problems with um, choice of plastics and them contaminating uh, water have now sort of been put to rest. If you, if you look back, you know, 25 years ago, there was a whole lot of papers written about such things and a lot of it related to well materials, like gazing materials and that sort of thing. But now it's pretty well accepted if you're choosing food grade, LDPE, um, that, that you're in pretty reasonable shape or food grade HDPE, uh, you know, that's sort of become reasonably well accepted. Um, I hope hmm. that answer the question. Yeah, excellent. Uh, anonymous again, just saying which products are available for long-term monitoring in deep aquifers greater than 250 metres, e.g. vented or non-vented water quality probes. Um, I'd probably say you know there's there is a few there is a few options out there. Um, if uh, if it came up not anonymous, I'd, I'd ask uh, if you wanted to you know contact me through those those details uh, through those details on the screen. There, um, we'll be able to talk through um, those types of um, equipment that you might be looking for. Uh, there's there certainly are a couple of options that you might be able to look at uh, for there. So. Feel free to shoot me an email. Um, Andrew Davidson uh, is the case study in New South Wales of Victoria. Uh, Victoria, Victoria was that uh, that case study that we just that we explored before. Um, the other one was in Queensland. The other one was in yeah in Queensland. Thanks, Richard. I couldn't quite remember where that one was. I think that's uh, I think that's everything that we've answered so far, um, but that's given us uh, a good allowance of time for today. Um, so we might wrap it up there. But uh, thanks everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, excellent uh, turnout, and really appreciate all your all your time uh, to listen to us um, talk about the the groundwater sampling. So. Um, you feel free to contact myself or Richard if you have any other further questions um, outside of this. Um, but from from myself uh, and from Richard, we thank you very much um, for for taking the time uh, today to listen to us. So thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>
Thanks very much, Carl. That was well done. Thanks, Richard.